Perfect. So, hi, thank you. I am uh, Luca Ferranti, and uh, I will now introduce this uh, interval linear algebra.gl package, which is this package about uh, doing uh, linear algebra but done rigorously. So, linear algebra with interval arithmetic and intervals. And uh, this package has been started uh, last summer, this year summer, as a GSOC pro project, where David and Marcel were my mentors back then. And here you can see the logo of the package. So, First of all, I will give some very basic introduction. I won't spend too much time on this because I think most of you are familiar with this. So you know that the linear algebra deals with matrices. So interval linear algebra will probably deal with the interval matrices. So now the question is, uh, what is an interval matrix? Well, the most intuitive idea that you have is correct. So it's a matrix where you have uh, intervals inside. More formally, you can think of uh, a ma interval matrix as a, a set of matrices. So it's the set of the real matrices so that each element belongs to the corresponding interval in the interval matrix. And uh, just uh, very quickly about uh, notation because we will need these uh, symbols soon. So just like intervals can be represented with the inf sup notation where you have the inferior, the lower bound and upper bound of the interval. So can interval matrices, so you can have the matrix of uh, lower bounds and matrix of upper bounds, but you can also have this uh, uh, midpoint radius notation, just like normal intervals, where you have the matrix of midpoints and uh, the matrix of red i. Now, next, uh, when we start uh, studying uh, normal linear algebra, we are told that matrices can be either invertible or non-invertible. And it turns out that this is very important for solving linear systems. So now what we want to do, we want to generalize this concept to interval matrices towards solving interval linear systems. And uh, particularly, we say that an interval matrix A is uh, regular if uh, all uh, the real matrices contained inside the interval matrix are invertible. So if all the matrices inside the interval matrix are invertible, then the interval matrix is called uh, regular. So regularity is uh, corresponding to being non-singular for real matrices. Uh, on the other side, if uh, a if there are some matrices inside the interval matrix which are not uh, uh, invertible, then we say that the matrix, the interval matrix uh, is a singular. So same terminology of real matrices. And it actually turns out that checking these properties for interval matrices, uh, it has exponential complexity. So it's Cohen P complete and NP complete, these two problems. Now uh, let's go towards uh, interval linear systems. So we have talked about interval matrices, a matrix of intervals. Now we talk about interval linear systems. So these linear systems, A, X equal B, where now A and B are interval matrix and vector respectively. And now uh, the first question, which is actually not that trivial is uh, what does it even mean to solve an interval linear system? Well. Italy, what it means is that we want to find the solution set called X. And this solution set is defined as the set of points in the Euclidean space where I'm working for which the real linear system AX equal B is satisfied for some real matrix A inside the interval matrix bold A and some real vector B inside the interval vector bold B. So the set of points which satisfy some real interval linear, some real systems contained in the interval linear system. And uh, you recall from uh, linear algebra that if a real matrix is uh, invertible, then the uh, system has a unique solution. Otherwise, it could be could have infinitely many solutions or no solutions at all. Uh, how this uh, concept generalizes to uh, interval matrices is that if this matrix A is regular, if the interval matrix is regular, then the solution set is guaranteed to be non-empty and bounded. So now uh, the question is, uh, how do we find this uh, interval, this uh, solution set? So how do we solve this uh, interval in our system now that we know what it means? Well, the first naive approach that would uh, come to mind is that, okay, we have matrices and vector of intervals. We could uh, do some Monte Carlo simulation 
So we randomly sample the elements inside the matrix and the vector, and we solve all the instances, we solve thousands of instances of this problem, and then plot the distribution of the solutions. Okay, so let's try it. So here I have a running example for this presentation. I have this interval matrix and this interval vector, and now I want to solve this interval linear system. And uh, first uh, I try Monte Carlo. So here I run uh, 100,000 times. So I randomly sampled matrix and vector 100,000 times, solved the real system and uh, plotted the solutions. And now we get the distribution. So, okay, uh, it's not a uniform distribution. Most of the points are close to a center. And then when you go far away, the density of the points uh, decreases. But now the interesting question is, uh, did we cover the whole set? So is this Monte Carlo simulation a good approximation of the solution set? Or are we missing some pieces? And uh, to answer this question, there's this uh, fantastic theorem in interval linear algebra called the Utley Prager theorem, which tells us that uh, an interval linear system, so a system of lean interval equations, can be converted to a system of uh, real inequalities. So I can convert interval equations to non-interval inequalities. And particularly, the conversion is given by this formula. So if I have the interval linear system A x equal b, then this solution set called x is, uh, can be characterized by this inequality, this set of inequalities. So each point that satisfies this equality belongs to the solution set and vice versa. Uh, okay, the, uh, this absolute value, if you're wondering, is taken element-wise in the vectors. And uh, now uh, you can show with uh, a little algebraic manipulation that uh, if n is the dimension of the problem, so you have uh, n equations, you can actually rewrite uh, this problem, getting rid of the absolute values, uh, with uh, of uh, two to the n uh, different uh, linear problems. So to two to the n distinct uh, LP problems, uh, which each has two uh, n equations. So basically you can convert uh, these to two to the n uh, linear programming problems. So linear inequalities, uh, removing the absolute values. Uh, what it means uh, geometrically is that you can solve uh, this problem by considering watch one orthant at a time. So the solution set will be convex in each orthant. And yeah, of course, since it's exponential, it scales badly for higher dimensions. So now we can do it. And in interval in algebra, we have this solve function, which takes the interval matrices. And then we can give the solver that we want to use. And now if we give the linear utley prager solver, it will use the utley prager theorem to characterize the solution set. So it will compute the polytopes, which are these uh, convex sets, one for each orthant. So now we get this star, which is actually also the log of the package. And yeah, as I've mentioned a few times, we notice that uh, in general, this uh, set is non-convex, but in each orthant is convex. And this is a general property of interval linear systems that uh, if you consider only one orthant, the part of the solution set in one single orthant will be convex. And also we notice that uh, our Monte Carlo simulation despite having 100,000 samples, which I would say was quite a lot, was actually not very satisfying. So we had these tails that were completely uncovered. Like if we had to base our deductions from the Monte Carlo, we wouldn't have thought that it would go beyond 2.5 and minus 2.5 in the x-axis. So actually Monte Carlo is not, was not satisfying in this example. And uh, yeah, so this is just because it's a very cool picture that uh, for low dimensions, we can use this utley prager theorem. So we can consider one orthant at a time and solve the LP problem. And for example, here in 3D, now I consider eight orthants. So I get that the solution set of this problem is this uh, star fish looking shape, which is a union of eight convex polytopes. But as the dimension increases, this becomes impractical because I cannot consider all the orthants separately. So uh, what do I do if I cannot characterize the solution set? 
well, if uh, I cannot find all uh, the exact solution set, what I want to find, I want to find an interval box bounding the solution set. So instead of finding this star, I want to find the tightest interval box, ideally, the, so the interval hull, the convex hull of uh, this uh, star. And yes, ideally, I want the interval hull, so the tightest interval box containing the solution set. But as it turns out, also this problem of finding the interval hull is NP hard, so it has exponential complexity. And now it's uh, legitimate to ask that, okay, so what can I do? Because so far I have only telling you what you cannot do. Well, what you can do, you can use uh, some algorithms and here there's uh, a list of the ones which are implemented in the package, uh, which uh, are polynomial time algorithms uh, and will find an enclosure of the solution set. But this enclosure has no guarantee to be the tightest possible enclosure. So has no guarantee to be the interval hull. And uh, there are some special classes of interval matrices for which these algorithms give the hull, but in general, there will be some overestimation. So here, again, we solve uh, the same problem of before using a Gaussian elimination. And I will talk about preconditioning later. And uh, when we plot it, uh, we get this result. So now uh, this uh, gray blue box was uh, the hull of before, which we couldn't compute without exponential complexity. And now we get that with Gaussian elimination, we have this uh, strictly larger box. And there are special cases when you can find the hull, but in general, this gives some overestimation. Uh, yes. So um, another interesting concept about the interval linear system is the concept of preconditioning, which is uh, probably familiar to many of you. So the idea of uh, preconditioning is that I want to uh, modify the problem to make it more numeric numerically more stable. So uh, what I do in practice is that if I have my interval linear system AX equal B, I multiply it by some real matrix. So now this C is not an interval matrix, it's a real matrix. And I obtain this uh, new problem. And hopefully, this will increase the numerical stability of the problem. And a very popular choice is to choose C to be the approximate inverse of the midpoint matrix. Approximate meaning that you don't care about the floating point error in this case. And a generally approximate solution is OK for preconditioning. And uh, why do we need uh, this preconditioning? Let's. Uh, Take an example. So suppose we want to solve uh, this interval linear system where the interval matrix is this uh, lower triangular matrix where all the elements in the lower triangular part are ones. So that's actually not really an interval matrix because they're all ones on the lower diagonal. And then the vector B has the interval minus two to two in the first element and all the other uh, elements in the vector are zero. Now, if uh, we solved this uh, with pen and paper, this would be the correct, the exact solution, the theoretical solutions. So now the first two elements are minus two and two, and then all the other elements are zero. And okay, oh, I see there's, uh, yeah, I'm showing now what it means by increasing numerical stability. So, oops. So, okay, now if uh, we try to solve, for example, with uh, a couple of uh, methods, uh, Gaussian elimination and Hans and Blick-Ron, we get that the first two elements are correct. But now if we observe what happens, we see that uh, the width of the intervals seems to start growing and growing, uh, minus four, minus eight, minus 16 to 16. And indeed, uh, if uh, we go back and try to take a bigger matrices, so now it's a 60 times 60 matrix, we see that, uh, the width of the intervals uh, grows exponentially until it basically says it's uh, somewhere on the real line, which is not very useful. So what happens is that uh, in general, if uh, you don't precondition the problem, you may have that uh, the, so the solution explodes. So the uh, width of the intervals just grows exponentially and the solution explodes as the, as the problem size increases. 
However, if we now precondition the problem, so if we use this inverse midpoint preconditioning in the solve function, we tend to precondition it, we see that we get rid of this problem and now we get the correct, so to speak, solution in both cases. However, there's a catch. The important thing to understand is that when I precondition, I'm actually changing the problem that I'm solving. So the preconditioned problem is not anymore the same problem I was trying to solve before, which means that now I'm changing the solution set. And particularly, I'm increasing the solution set. Again, there are special cases which are particularly nice, but in general, if I apply some preconditioning, I will enlarge the solution set, which means that when I try to solve the preconditioned problem with Gaussian elimination, Hans and Blickron, whatever, I'm effectively trying to bound a bigger solution set. So compared to the original solution set, I will have an even bigger overestimation. So yeah, uh, just take home lesson about this preconditioning is that um, it's uh, needed in a lot of cases. So uh, those algorithms have some assumptions and uh, if uh, the interval matrix doesn't meet those assumptions for the algorithm to work, preconditioning will help meeting those conditions. But as a price to pay, it will also increase the solution set. So we'll try to bound a bigger set and it will have a bigger overestimation. And uh, yeah, the software has also some sort of uh, uh, heuristic checks based on what kind of interval matrix we have so that it uh, tries to decide itself whether you should or should not precondition. So if I just say solve A1B1, which was the exam from before, it finds the correct solution. So by default, it uses Gaussian elimination. And now it says, okay, for this case, uh, it might be good to precondition, otherwise I could get into problems. Yes. So um, this was uh, very exciting. We saw a lot of pictures, a lot of animations, a lot of colors. It looks like very fun, but there's um, a teeny tiny problem with these uh, interval linear systems uh, that uh, in general, they're actually useless for applications because uh, those uh, interval linear systems, they assume that all the elements in the interval matrix and in the interval vector are independent. So we have seen with David, Luis, and uh, everyone that we can come into this uh, dependency problem. If uh, the elements, uh, if the intervals are not dependent, are not independent, if there's some correlation, if they depend on a common parameter, then we have this dependency problem, which will lead to some excessive overestimation. So if now I consider this uh, parametric interval in our system, PILS, like the beer, what uh, I actually have is that uh, the matrices A and B, they uh, depend on some parameters, P. So now P is a vector of parameters. And the, the entries of the matrix and the vector depend on some of these parameters in the vector. And each parameter has a range. So I have an interval vector, P hat, which gives the range for each parameter. And now you see, now I have repeated variables and the dependency problem kicks in. So, well, what happens, it happens that in principle, I could, I could substitute. Okay, so uh, now I have another running example. Sorry for the confusion. So, um, so let's see what happens if uh, we try to solve uh, problems which have parametric dependency. So here we consider this uh, structural mechanics problem and thanks to Jorge for uh, taking care of the mechanics part, which I don't really understand. So uh, what we have here, we have this uh, structure. So I have uh, these bars, uh, which are connecting these nodes. And I have a force pushing uh, this node here. And uh, these two are, I guess, uh, bounded somehow. And then uh, I define uh, the parameters of my problem, the Young modulus and the cross section of these bars. And then otherwise, uh, I normally compute uh, the, the stress. I think it's stress what I'm computing here. I'm not sure. I compute uh, this quantity that mechanical engineers care about. But then uh, I also add a little more spices uh, and assume that for this uh, third element here, connecting nodes two and three, I have some uncertainty. So otherwise, I define all the others uh, uh, as a scalar numbers, uh, normal numbers. 
But then I assume that uh, for this guy here, I have some uncertainty. So for that guy, I have an interval. And uh, yeah, this is a very new feature. So interval in algebra, so new that it's not even there yet. It's still on a pull request that I can uh, use. Uh, I, it has a small built-in uh, symbolic engine so that it's pattern included, but uh, will also work with the uh, symbolics and uh, dynamic polynomials and so on. So I define this variable S as symbolic variable. And then I define the P hat from before. So the vector of ranges where the parameters can range from. So now uh, this variable S is defined, can assume any value within this interval. So this is uh, assuming a 10% uncertainty on the value of the material. So now S is somewhere in this interval, but I don't know where. Now, uh, doing uh, using Horges codes and doing some mechanics of things, we can assemble this matrix, this matrix K and uh, this vector Q. And the idea is that if I want to compute how much each node will move when I push a force, I, can, I need to solve this uh, linear system, K times vector of displacement equals Q. And now you see that this K is a symbolic matrix. So it depends on this uh, S. And particularly now, this has a fine dependence on the parameters, which is the best what uh, interval era algebra can handle. And yes, I could just evaluate my matrix over this interval and get a normal interval matrix. And I could also solve normally the problem. So uh, convert my parametric matrices and matrix and vector to interval matrix and vector and solve the interval in our system. And I get these numbers. But now if uh, I solve the parametric problem, so now interval in algebra has a small uh, algorithm to solve a parametric interval in our systems with a fine dependency. I observe now that actually the naive approach had a huge overestimation. And here is a visualization with some scaling because for this problem, actually the displacement was very small in absolute value. But relatively, if I zoom 100 times in both and I compare the naive one to the parametric proper one and taking the dependence into account, I see that actually the huge one was giving a huger displacement. And uh, well, yeah, the there, problem with, yeah. There are some questions on the Zoom chat Yeah, that you could check from, mm, okay. to check when you're finished. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I have two slides. So maybe if I go through those mm -hmm. and then okay. check if it's okay. Good. Good. Okay, the one is, is, is the precondition solution always guaranteed to be bounding of the true solution? Uh, assuming the algorithm is implemented correctly so that I don't have bugs in the code, yes. So the precondition can enlarge the solution set, but it will never shrink the solution set. That was easy. Uh, and other one seems longer, so I'll check soon. And yeah, so the previous example was very small, but now if we consider this uh, other example from continuous mechanics where we have this uh, bar, so now this is one continuous uh, object, and then we uh, poke it on the top, so we push it, we apply a force, a tension, I think it was called, to this object. And uh, we assume that we have some uncertainty on the Young modulus of this object. And uh, I simulated this with 10% uncertainty on the Young modulus. If uh, you solve with the naive one, actually you don't solve it. So the algorithms for uh, normal interval linear systems cannot handle this problem, which has uh, 400 and it's 450 times 450 metrics. And the reason for that is that if you neglect the dependency, between the elements, if we just assume that all the intervals are independent, then actually that matrix will be an overestimation of the true parametric matrix. And that matrix treated as independent, normal interval matrix, will look like it's not regular. So it will say, I cannot solve it because this looks like it's not regular. So if I treat it just independently and neglect, neglect the dependency problem, it will look like the matrix is not even regular. So it will have an unbounding solution. But if I take properly the uh, dependence into account, I will get uh, this plot. So I can solve it and I get minimum and maximum displacement and I can see where, what is the range of uh, displacement of this bar. 
Uh, yes, so I have uh, a couple of miscellaneous, also nicer things that are in the package. I will probably just go very quickly. So uh, one thing is that uh, when you do multiplications uh, with uh, interval matrices, uh, that's actually computationally pretty expensive. But uh, one uh, very cool thing that the RAMP figure out is that uh, you can uh, reduce uh, a multiplication of interval matrices uh, to uh, multiplication of uh, real floating point matrices, changing the run, run, rounding mode only once uh, during the whole computation. And so here is the benchmark of this uh, naive approach versus ramp, ramp approach. And as you see, ramp gives uh, a significant speed up. And actually for some eigenvalue code that was uh, very important because without uh, this multiplication, even bounding the eigenvalues of a uh, 100 and 100 matrix would take forever. Uh, yeah, speaking about eigenvalues, this is still uh, uh, very, very experimental. But uh, one thing that you can uh, start doing uh, is that, um, yeah, yeah, it can also bound the eigenvalues of interval matrices. So if you have these interval matrix, uh, and uh, you want to find uh, a box uh, around uh, the possible eigenvalue set, the package can do it. Yeah, and so uh, that's all that uh, interval linear algebra is uh, definitely not stable. There's a lot of work going on and it's uh, at uh, the early days. Uh, and uh, well, it should have uh, new features coming all the time. In practice, it doesn't. Uh, but uh, this parametric interval in our systems is the greatest uh, project ambition that I have at the moment for the package. There's uh, a issue in the repository taking parametric interval in our system seriously, where I wrote some thoughts, then also some other features to add. I have some issues of enhancement. And yeah, the ultimate goal is uh, uh, linear algebra done rigorously. Ignore the link is incorrect. And uh, that's all from my side. Thank you very much for listening. I hope I didn't go over time. And I hope also didn't go too fast. So I'll just read the questions now. That, that was great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Let's clap virtually. So, uh, so for the Monte Carlo method that you say is unsatisfactory, do I interpret it correctly that uniform is sampling the intervals in the matrix vectors? It's not the same. Think there's any chance you can? Oh, yeah, that's a fantastic question because uh, there's uh, actually, okay, so if I understand correctly, the question is that uh, you sampled the uniformly. So from each interval, uniformly sampled, and that was unsatisfactory. Uh, so is there any chance uh, you can improve the coverage by? So I guess the question is uh, is there any smarter sampling way to do it? Uh, so I'm uh, not aware if uh, in practice there are uh, like some strategies or algorithms for practically doing it, but at least in theorem, in theory, there's uh, a theorem that if you have an interval linear system, then you can uh, compute the so-called Etli Prager canonical form, which means that uh, for each point uh, in the solution set, Uh, what is it? For each point in the solution set, each point of the solution set is the solution of a real linear system where each element in the matrix, except one, is a, a like border of the interval. So each element of the matrix, except one, is either upper bound or lower bound. And then only one element is from inside the interval. So in principle, there's this theorem that tells you that you don't need to sample from inside. You could just uh, take the extreme of the intervals and then just range for one interval. Uh, I'm not sure how mature, how strong the theory is to know what element can vary and uh, what you need to fix to upper or lower bound. I'm not even sure whether uh, you can freely choose which one you fix to be uh, boundaries of the interval and which one you choose to vary. But in principle, you wouldn't need to sample. In principle, you would just need to consider the extreme of the intervals and the sample from one interval. So I guess there are, in principle, smarter ways to do the sampling, but I'm not very sure in practice how working sampling strategies there are, how well working sampling strategies there are for interval inner systems.
Yes. So you could try doing some nonlinear, non-uniform sampling where you sample cl more closer to the boundaries of the. Yeah, the that period. would be, a, for example, a strategy. I guess would be interesting to try. Could be added to the documentation to the as sampling strategy and see how it changes. Mm -hmm. 